All right, so back in lecture 11, I showed you a um, number of uh, ways of visualizing stuff. And what the, the program that I used was called Visit. Now, uh, also I told you that there are basically two big visualization tools. One of those is called Visit, and the other one is Peer View. And the story with Peer View and Visit is basically a little bit like what I um, talked about when I talked about editors where there's Emacs and there's VI. And that there's people who use Emacs who cannot possibly understand why anybody would want to use VI. And then there's people who use VI who cannot possibly understand why anybody would want to use Emacs. It's a little bit like this for um, visualization tools as well. I'm a visit person, and I cannot understand why anybody would want to use Paraview. But then there are people who use peer review, who cannot understand why you would want to use Visit. And so um, because these are the big, two big tools, I invited a friend and colleague of mine, Timo Heister, to show us a little bit about um, peer review. So he's a peer review person. Uh, and even though we've known each other for a long time and we work very well together, um, he's in the enemy camp. And um, <laughs> maybe this is my opportunity to learn something and for him to show me a little bit. So what we're going to do is essentially uh, run through many of the same steps that we've done with the visualization uh, that I showed you in lecture 11 on uh, using Visit, where uh, we showed you how to, let's say, you visualize a scalar field or how to visualize a vector field and so on and so forth. And basically, we will do the same things with peer review today. So I would say with this, um, it's good to have you here. Thank um, you, Wolfgang. Why don't you go ahead? Show yeah. us how this works. So yeah, uh, first let me say I'm not an, an expert, but I, I use Paraview for my visualization uh, stuff every day. And I'm also curious to learn a little bit from Wolfgang what is possible in Visit and what is not possible in Paraview. So I guess that's useful for both of us then to do this. All right, so um, let's get started. Um, I'm just going to launch Paraview. Uh, you can download that for free. And it, um, if it starts, it roughly looks like this here. Um, so you have the big 3D view of your, of your graphics. And um, you will notice that this is very similar to uh, Visit. And the reason is that they both are based on the VTK toolkit. So underlying, the underlying thing is, is, is the same. So um, yeah, you shouldn't be surprised if, if it handles very similar. So um, let me go ahead and point you to the wide window on the left, which is the pipeline browser browser, and there you see your files that you're loading in and your filters and all the things you are doing. So uh, let me right click and uh, hit open to open files. And I prepared a couple of files uh, from, from the DL2 examples from step four uh, we're going to start with. And um, here you see uh, the 2D output and a 3D output. And I'll start with the 2D file that I'm opening up. Note here that um, Paraview decided to group those uh, into, into one file because it thinks they are numbered, and so they, they belong together to a data set, but that's not really the case here. So um, one thing you should notice, um, as soon as I do something, I often have to hit an Apply button here in the Object Inspector. So let's do that. And this is what we are greeted with, which is the 2D, simulation, the 2D output of, of, of this uh, step four tutorial. So, um, so that's already simpler than it is with Visit, because in Visit, I actually have to select a plot before it shows me anything. Yes, so the standard is always a surface plot of the object that you have. Um, so you have, you have all your files listed in the pipeline browser, and you can toggle the visibility on and off of all those files. And the thing that is selected uh, can be changed with the object inspector down here. You have several tabs here and uh, options, depending on what kind of object you have. Um, there's a lot of very useful information down here. Uh, for example, if I go to information, I'll see uh, how many cells I have and what solution variables I have. So if I can have several, several different variables, and I see this is a scalar variable, the, the values are between 1 and 2, and, uh, and so on. So this is really useful to have. OK. So um, the main view, you can rotate around while holding the left mouse button. You can uh, zoom with the right mouse button, and you can move around with holding both mouse buttons. And um, let me reset this so this looks nice again. So now let me talk about um, the, the most used features up there. Those are the drop-down lists here, the three of them. 
Um, let me start with the one on the right, which says surface right now, which is the standard form on how to visualize this thing. So I can switch it to wireframe, which shows uh, just a wireframe view of that object. And surface with edges shows you the mesh uh, overlaid over the solution. And there's other, other things to do, but it's not really useful for 2D. For, for 3D, it makes sense to look at volume. We'll do that in a minute. OK. Um, the one on the left, the drop down here, selects wh where the color comes from for the surface plot. So solid color just uh, renders us in white. Not very interesting. And if you have more than one variable, you can, you can select which variable should be uh, the one giving the color. And uh, this one is if you have a vector valued, component, vector -valued object, then you can um, pick which component or the magnitude or whatever you want to plot. OK, so this is the basic way how to look at a file. Um, there's um, these three buttons here control the coloring. Um, so the first one shows the, the legend on the side, so you see what the range is. The second one allows you to change the color scale and change uh, what the minimum and the maximum value is to be displayed. And the last one allows you to rescale to the actual data range that we have. We don't, we, we'll need that later on. I'll come back to that. OK, so if you've seen the uh, video about visit, uh, Wolfgang hopefully told you about filters, I guess. Well, I think <laughs> we call them either plots or attributes or, or operators, actually, okay. I think. Operators OK, so I, right I have to talk about it a little bit. So basically, we have sources and filters. So sources are either your files that you read from disk, or it might be any other kind of object that you can create inside here. For visualizing finite element results, this is not really useful um, to have different sources. But um, the filters are what is interesting. Here they are grouped by different categories. But in, if you go to alphabetical, you get a list of all the filters that are supported. And they operate either on a file itself, on the data set itself, or on another filter. So you can stack them and do certain things. That's just like visits operators. That's right. That's right. And yeah, I guess it's the same underlying uh, technology that is there. So one thing you might want to do is, that I would, would like to show you is, so this is a 2D plot, but you might want to uh, visualize it as a, as, a, as a height map, so that the Z component of this thing is, depends on the color scheme. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Filters, and I'm going to Warp by Scalar. So you warp the 2D thing by a scalar, because our solution variable is, is only a scalar variable. And uh, now you see that here in the pipeline, I get a new object, which is called warp by scalar. And here I can pick which solution variable. And if I just hit apply, it does something. Um, let me re reset the view so that everything is visible. And now you can see that this is um, what we expected and we, what you probably saw already. Um, and you can play around with it, for example. You can um, scale it so that, that it's not as, um, as high. Um, OK, so um, this is the simple filter. And you'll notice here that the original file is still there, but it's hidden automatically um, with a small i here. So I can uh, hide the warped thing and display the original one, or I can also display both of them, whatever I want to do. And um, let me show you, um, well, quickly, quickly show you what other filters there are. Um, most of them are not very useful right now. Many of them we're going to use for the 3D thing. So I guess I should better go to the 3D. Can, um, can you so do ISO contour lines, for example? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I should, I, let, let, let's do this on the original 2D thing. And um, so where are they? Contour. Uh, there. So if I just hit Apply then this is not very pretty. <laughs> well, we need maybe more. Yes. So one thing you can do, so it, it just picks one value in the middle, which is not really useful. So I delete that one, and I say new range. And it automatically fills in the minimum, the maximum, and 10 steps. So if you just hit OK and apply, then you get the contours how you would expect okay. them to look like. Um, and you can also, of course, uh, o overlay this well. You can't really see it very well. But uh, you get the idea that you can display several things at once. Um, OK. So with that, um, I'm going to open the 3D file. So again, uh, I right-clicked somewhere here, 
I, I think you can also go to file open, um, which does the same thing. <laughs> Hang on for a second. So, so before you do this, um, in when I showed you how to use Visit, one of the things um, that always bothers me about Visit is that it produces so much crap in on the screen. Yeah. It shows the name of the file. It shows a legend that I may or may not be interested in. It has the um, the tripod at, at the bottom left, for example. How do you get rid of the um, the axes, for example, here? I find that incredibly distracting. There is absolutely no reason why it should have the yellow and the red line in the center. How do you get rid of this? OK, so there's um, one button above the screen here, which is Edit View Options. And I hope that I'm going to find everything <laughs> there. So one thing is the background color, which is good if you take screenshots, for example. Okay. If you want to include them, then you want a white background. And uh, at annotation, you get orientation axes and center of rotation axes. And if you do those, then they are. Ah, much better. And the legend yeah. you can get away, get, get okay. rid of with that way. Well, actually, create it and put it there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I like this a lot better already. Yeah. Okay. Good. So let me open the 3D file. Or anything else? No. Please go ahead. Okay. So. Um, let me hide the 2D thing. You, you see here now very well that I have two files open and that it's a hierarchy of, of, of filters that both of these, the warp and the contour, depend on the original data set. So I can also minimize this if I don't need this anymore. OK, so this is now the, the same example running in 3D, so you can rotate around. And now you, you might be interested in something more advanced, how to look into, into the mesh. And uh, for that, we are also going to use filters. So one thing might be that you want to, um, there's actually, uh, let me point you to this, to this uh, toolbar up here. There's the, the very useful things are there already uh, for us to use. So this is the contour that we used already. Um, this is clip. I'll show you how this looks like. Um, I'm just going to hit apply. You basically have a plane that is put into 3D space and that, that cuts half of your object away or the, the, the part that is on one side. You can also move it around. And uh, so this is how you cut it open. What do you always use on the keyboard when you want to, say, apply? Uh, it's Alt-A is, okay. the, is the shortcut for okay. apply. There's also, by the way, just um, there's also a way to get rid of this by hitting this button, which means apply changes to parameters automatically. Okay, so this, this way, you never have to hit apply. Um, it's probably, for these visualizations, probably a good idea to do that. But you don't want to do this if you have a very big data set where if it contents constantly updates, uh, it, you have to wait a minute until it renders. Yeah. But here, it's, it's perfectly fine. So for example, now I can drag around this thing, and it automatically updates how yeah. you would expect it. So clip has a cuts half or a part of your object away. Um, instead, um, you can also do a slice, which looks similar, but it just uh, keeps the slice. Um, the 2D slice of that. And uh, notice that this slice here, again, uh, is, is an object. So I can change the way it's rendered. So I can, for example, render it in wireframe if I wanted to. That looks a little bit strange um, anyway. OK, so that's clip and slice. Let me go back to the original object. One thing you might want to know is where in that box is the value bigger than a certain value? Um, there's uh, what's called a threshold. And here you pick um, the variable you want to use for that, and you pick a lower and an upper bound. So let's say I'm only interested in uh, higher part, and then you get this uh, interesting, uh, interesting looking uh, object by only displaying the cells that have a certain value. It looks like a 3D game of life, the yes. uh, cellular automaton game. Yes. So um, I didn't talk about volume rendering in the beginning. So you can do volume rendering, uh, which is a bit slower. And it's not really interesting in this case because the middle is boring, because the edges are, are the interesting parts here. But yeah, so you can have a quick impression how that looks like. Um, OK, I guess that's, um, that's the simplest thing if you have one scalar solution variable. Is there anything that can comes you, to mind that you want to know? Can you do isocontour surfaces again? Uh, yes. So let me um, just hit contours. And um, let me hide the original object so that you see the contour better. Mm -hmm. It also picked, again, one contour in the middle. Um, if you want to have more, 10 is probably a bit too much. But let's say we have five steps between the minimum and the maximum. 
then it looks like this. Let me rotate around. It's also very interesting artwork. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing I wanted to point, want to point out here is that if you go to display, there are a lot of options on how to change things um, from the coloring scheme and so on and rendering. And one thing that is useful, especially for contours, is that you can change the transparency. So um, here now they are partly transparent. Can you change the transparency for each individual contour surface? I don't think so. I oh, mean, visit is so much better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you can create separate control objects. Of course. Okay, that's that's fair. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I like that a lot in, in visit that I give the um, th that the outer layers are more transparent than the inner ones, so that you um, that you can look through the outer ones and the inner ones really show. Yeah, you know, that makes that sense. Yeah. Well, you just create multiple then. Yes. Uh, multiple that's right. contours. That's right. Okay. All right. Um, so, why, so when you, um, you you just accumulate filters here, yes. um, you never delete any. You just oh well, um, maybe I should do that. Um, yeah, so you can just hit the delete button, or you can right click and delete, or okay. you can just hit the backspace key to get rid of the selected object. Okay. Um, I wanted to f have it fill up a little bit so that you can see how a complex project might look like if you have yeah. several filters and and objects loaded, and files loaded. Okay. Um, let's look at an example where we have more, uh, more than one variable. Um, so let me go to, that was step four, by the way. And now I'm going to load step 22. Um, what you see here is uh, step 22 does an adaptive refinement loop. So it starts with a coarse mesh, output the solution as, uh, as solution zero. And then it refines a bit, has a little bit finer mesh out output once. So what I'm going to do now is instead of just loading one file, I'm selecting the, the list of files here. So I don't even have to expand it. So it uh, opens up all the solutions. And um, so this is how it looks like. Let me uh, look at it again this way. So now um, if I point you to this drop down box, you have velocity and pressure as your two unknowns. That's the Stokes system that is solved here. So if I go to velocity, it plots the magnitude, and you can also look at the individual components here uh, for the coloring scheme. And this is the pressure. Okay. Um, now, um, up here is the, the time uh, control thing. And uh, so it thinks that this is a time dependent problem. We're going to have a time dependent problem in a minute. So here it's just uh, the different resolutions of the mesh. So let me turn on the mesh again by going to wireframe. Um, so here you can see that in step by step, the mesh gets refined uh, in the area of interest, basically, to resolve the problem. So why did I load this example? Let me go to the coarser mesh. Is I wanted to uh, show you how to, how to deal with uh, vector valued uh, solution variables. So um, one thing you might want to do is to plot vector arrows uh, on the field. So there's also a filter here, which is also on the toolbar, which is called glyph. And uh, you have a lot of options here. And the default is not very pretty because it colors the arrows in the same color as the pressure, which is also the thing in the background. So the first thing you, you want to do is give it a solid color. So this is just uh, is it, So why did it, why did it do? So when you, when you select a glyph, it automatically picks the velocity. You didn't even yes. have to select that? Because yes. there's only one right. vector field in there. Right, right. OK. That's, that's what it automatically mm -hmm. does. Um, but you can pick it, of course, if you want okay. to. And you can also pick how to draw those. Uh, what I, for example, like for 2D things is uh, 2D arrows uh, drawn here. There are also too many arrows, uh, arrows drawn here. You can control this at the very bottom on the property pane. So you can, for example, say I want uh, less arrows than before. OK, um, okay so this is, um, this is how to display um, yeah, the velocity field. Mm -hmm. um, a bit more finicky to get to work are streamlines. I will try to do it, but I might need to play around with it a little bit. Yeah, I think I didn't do this for uh, visit either because <laughs> it's the same thing. You, uh, there's yeah. always, uh, you have to select where the streamline starts, and then you have to select the integrator that yes. determines how accurate and how, how, let's say, how angled or how, how smooth these curves are. Yeah. 
So I, I had streamlines there visible for a second, but now they are gone. Uh, whatever I did wrong. <laughs> uh, it might be that it's, uh, so yeah. You have to be careful because it's a 2D plot. And what I said is uh, I put this line here and um, it creates streamlines on this line. And if the line has a Z component, then it doesn't, doesn't hit the, the 2D mesh and then you get no streamlines. Okay, um, I guess that's a good example for, um, for how to plot vector value things. And notice that, um, notice that um, yeah, I, I have in the background, I still have the, the pressure plotted, right? And I can combine this however I want. Um, okay, um, one thing I wanted to show here is um, what I find useful if I have a solution that has um, if I have a thing that I want to plot that has two components, and I, for example, want to see both of them at once. Um, so, oops, I somehow undocked the this, this, that thing. Okay. Um, so let's say um, I want to display a second thing. I could load the file again, um, um, but I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm going to use the, what is called the calculator. Um, which allows you to combine arbitrary inputs to a out, new output. And um, so the output is called result, and it's a point data. And what I'm basically going to do is I'm just going to copy the, the, the pressure over. And now the calculator is the one that's visible. And I can, in display, if I go to the bottom, I can translate it. So I can move it upwards and also display the original one. And now I have two things. And I can pick for one of them, I can display the velocity instead. So now I have one data set that displays two different okay. variables at the same time. I think this is kind of convenient. OK, so um, now um, we have prepared a really time, uh, uh, a problem that is really time dependent and not several time steps, uh, uh, not several refinement steps before. Uh, let me so this comes that. from Step 26, which I talked in one of the previous lectures. Yeah. So this is a list of, of files. Again, they are just numbered consecutively. And ParaV automatically picks up that those have the same base name, basically. So I just pick that. And um, this is how it looks like. Uh, you, so the first thing would be to look, oh, OK, I have one variable that's called u. And I put on the, the legend, and I'll see, oh, the values are between 0 and 0. That's not very interesting. The, the initial condition of yes. the problem. Yeah. So if I hit play now, you won't see anything, only that the time is running. Um, but if I stop at some, some later point, um, there is something happening. So what I have to do here is I have to rescale to the data range. And now you see that there's something interesting going on here. So if I go back to the start now, you set, you set this color scale for once, and uh, it's used for the whole time. So now let me play it. So you see there's um, yeah, a source that is, that is oscillating there and that is diffusing um, in, that, in that example program. And one thing you might want to do is set the data range to the minimum and the maximum over the whole time. And this you can do. Uh, I hit the button here to change the color scale, and you just hit rescale to a temporal range. You get a warning where you click yes. And then it thinks for a few seconds by loading in all the files and computing that. And depending on how fast your computer is, uh, now it is done. And by mm -hmm. the way, you can also change uh, the color scales here, for example, if you want, want it to look differently. That's a very cool feature with, with picking the minimum and the maximum over the entire simulation. That I, I don't think that Visit can do that, or at least I haven't figured out how to do it. Um, so there, what I typically do is I, I go through the entire simulation and I just look at the color scale. Visit automatically adjusts the color scale with every time step. Oh, okay. And so um, th that's often a little bit confusing because what you see in one for one time step has nothing to do with what you see for another time step because mm -hmm. the scale is different. And so you have to watch what exactly the maximum and the minimum is, and then you s then you can scale the plot so that it takes in the maximum and the minimum over the entire visualization. Okay. So this is, this is a cool feature. Yeah, that's kind of useful. I agree. OK. Can you create a movie from this? Yes, you can, actually. Um, so um, if you go to the File menu, there, is, um, there are several options to, to save things. And what we want is save animation. And here, this, it's not straightforward to use. So you have to fiddle a little bit with that to get it to work, to have the right size and so on. And you also want a different background, for example. 
And if you just hit Save Animation for now, it offers you to save it. And um, so you can either output images that are consecutively numbered, and you can use convert or whatever utility you mm -hmm. want you want to use to. That's what I typically use if I want to make a movie. Um, but it can also apparently generate uh, movies directly. Um, I haven't tried that, um, so I don't know. Yeah, I, I do. So Visit has a very similar feature where you could say um, set movie, or save movie, or set save. An, I think save movie. Um, and I typically st save all of these um, individual files as PNG files, each time step as a PNG file. Because when you save it like this, you have this enormous gray um, frame around it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it doesn't show just the thing that you really want. I, I would like it to be cropped on the left and the right, top and bottom. And so what I typically do is I save um, every, every frame of this movie as a PNG file. And then I call a script on it that just trims uh, the, oh, okay. uh, the edges. So the, the, there's this tool that's called Convert that has a, an option called Trim, mm -hmm. which just cuts off the edges. And then I just say Convert uh, Startup PNG uh, X dot MPEG, for example, yep. something like this. Um, so that I figure that works exactly like this. Yes, so. that's, that's exactly true. And it takes the, your settings from your viewport. So um, you can set it up so that there are not a lot of borders around okay. it if you wanted to. You just have to resize it accordingly. OK. Um, I have one more thing that I can show, um, which is uh, the data set from step 40. And I think you haven't, you haven't talked about parallel. Uh, no, that's still on the list of lectures to come. Parallel things yet. So let me just go into the, into the uh, output files directory here that I have. Um, what you see here is. Um, this, this run is created running in parallel with, with five processors. And so each processor owns part of the domain. And um, so each of them outputs their part of their domain into a single file in this, in this program here. So the solution number three consists of files from zero to four. So these are the five files. And this is um, like a directory saying, this solution con consists of those five files. And this is the ones that we want to load in. So let me just quickly do this. Um, so let, let us pick. Um, so the, the, the first numbers here are from different refinement steps. So let me pick the pvtu file for 6, which contains all the other uh, uh, files automatically. And OK, it's now gray, so let us display a solution. So this is how the solution looks like. And uh, we export a s the other variable, which is called the subdomain, which is the who is the processor that owned that, that part of the domain? Yeah, that's pretty cool. You do a parallel computation, and every processor writes their own file. And then you write this directory. And um, both visit and pair view can visualize all of the files that were created by all of these processors. Yeah. So it's smart enough so that it really works and not creates a time-dependent problem or something like that. Um, yeah. I think this is pretty cool. Um, so I, I think I have sort of an idea now how to, um, how to use this peer view. I, I might still be a visit man. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I think it has a lot of features that I probably should try at one point or mm -hmm. another. So I, I hope that you have gotten sort of an impression of uh, the sort of things that you can do with peer view. Um, it, it certainly has many of the same features as visit, because they both built on this VTK uh, library. Mm -hmm. uh, I think ultimately what it boils down to is some people like that user interface better. Uh, yeah. Some people like the other. Just like um, people who use VI like to type escape colon Q uh, to get out of the editor. And with Emacs, it's control X, control C. Um, anyway, yeah. uh, thanks for um, showing us uh, these things here. But, um, thanks for having me. Yeah. I okay. hope that was useful. Yes. <laughs>